Right view. This is critically important. We're going to be talking about the Eightfold Path. If we don't understand right view, we will not have the Eightfold Path. There'll be eight path factors, but they won't be noble. They won't be the Arya Eightfold Path. So everything begins with right view and the other factors such as right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right speech are not what we would call right unless they are informed by right view. Right view is the beginning. All things follow it. When one has right view, it's like the sun coming up in the morning. Illumination will follow. If the sun doesn't come up, there will be no illumination. The other simile that is used for right view is the seed simile. So right view is like a seed of a delicious fruit or um, some sort of sugary kind of uh, jaggery or something like this, which was very popular in India at the time. And if that seed is not in place in good moist soil, that plant won't appear and there won't be any delicious fruit. And even if you have the right soil and the right moisture, if the seed is not there, no delicious fruit. So this is the essence. Right view is the seed. All the other things are the soil and the moisture factor. Of course, right view without cultivation, without maintenance, without watering, will not appear or appear in a very feeble form. But right view is the condition without which nothing will follow. Now, right view, of course, the first idea about right view is the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are the essence of right view. It's a preoccupation, a focus. All attention is focused on the preeminent feature, that is, human distress, human suffering unsatisfactory experience of humans. And this we have to investigate and bring into light, not to avoid, not to deny. So we have to bring it into light with the right emotive quality behind it as well. This kind of investigation really is not done well in fear and anxiety. So right view is not terror inducing. It is alarming in some ways, in a good way. You basically, before a ship goes down, you want the alarm to go off. You want the fire alarms to go off. The fire alarms are not to scare you, they're to alert you to the danger of the situation. So right view, beginning with, there is danger, there's suffering, there's a problem. This has to be heard and also has to be heard in the right way. The best attitude to take in an emergency is to be remain calm in the emergency. But you really have to do something about it as well. The alarm has gone off and we have to do something about it. So that's the spirit of the Four Noble Truths. However, right view has other implications and more or less what we would call mundane right view. It's very interesting what they go through. One of them is simply there is or there are mother and father. It's a very brief and cryptic sentence. There is mother. There is father. That's part of right view. Very interesting. Uh, what is it saying? It's saying actually that these certain sort of family relationships, the absolute necessity for having a father and a mother, you don't get born without a father and a mother, is a real thing. It's not a mere convention. It's a real thing. And there are real relationships there. The parents to the child and the child to the parents. And 
you will see in all developed civilizations that there is a, a strong concern and regard and necessity for family concerns with the dynamics of families and the patience and goodwill and generosity that is required on the part of both the child and the parents. Recently I was looking at a documentary on what's called feral children to see what, what is it, how does a human behave without being raised by humans? It's quite tragic actually. They are deeply warped and deformed. They don't ultimately ever recover. And if this occurs in the early part of life, the first few years of life, occasionally kids are raised by animals like dogs or wild animals. They don't uh, ever recover from that. They don't learn speech. Uh, they don't learn empathy, etc. So we are creatures that require nurturing. Not all creatures require nurturing. Fish and so forth don't require a mummy. They just get hatched out of an egg and swim away. <laughs> so, but humans do. And there is a two-way street there. We have obligations back in both directions. And we have to appreciate our humanity. Without care, at least a caregiver, you know, you might lose both your parents very early in life, but somebody has to raise you. And without some sort of nurturing care and language and the experience of empathy, you really will not become human. So there are cases where people are raised in these terrible orphanages where there aren't any staff to actually take care of the child other than to just feed them, change their diaper. So they also turn out to be incredibly warped and stunted. So it's not merely a matter of being around humans, it's a matter of having communion with humans. To be a human requires nurturing by humans and nurturing. So this is something to be brought in. The Buddha is very concerned with loyalty and uh, the patience and so forth that is involved in families. That's, a, that's part of right view. It's very interesting. The other part is a commitment to the idea there is this world and a world beyond that now it's strange to say that there is this world it's possible to have philosophies that deny the existence of this world <laughs> and certainly very commonly to have philosophies that would deny the existence of a next world so what they're saying is that to have right view one must have a conviction of continuation beyond death. Now, how do they come up with this? How do they rephrase this? They call it choosing between views, making wise choices between views. So it's not that it has to be proven or demonstrated. It's a matter of selectivity. You're selecting views. And if you select certain views, such as at death, all that I am ceases. There is no consequences or continuation beyond that. That's a choice. That's a selection out of various possible views. Some people may be convinced that it's the only selection, that there's the only evidence points to that. They, in the text, they simply disagree. It's based on, it might be based on reasoning. It might be based on tradition or persuasion. Those are not considered to be the strongest or the kind of right references for establishing yourself in right view. So it's a choice of wisdom about what you're going to do with your life and how you're going to view it. And it's really a choice. And this is liberating for a lot of people. They don't realize it's just, there are choices to be made about views. There's no compelling evidence that would absolutely determine your view. There are choices to be made. The next word I use is conviction. Conviction is your choice should display itself in the way you feel day by day and the way you act and speak day by day. That's when it's a conviction. 
Some people ask me about what I believe. The very word belief is problematic, but it's not really a belief if you don't act on it. You can say you believe something, but if it doesn't actually inform your speech and actions, it's not a belief. So I use the word conviction. You are undertaking a, a view of things which shapes your speech and actions. And you can't fool yourself. It has to be sincere as well. It's an internal decision and it has great benefits. So there are gifts and fruits of gifts. This is another part of right view. So there is generosity and there are results of generosity. Not again, you can have views where it's why be generous, everybody for themselves. All kinds of arguments against generosity and for selfishness. There's all kinds of stuff about that. It's not an automatic, obvious thing, but to have the right view is that there is generosity and there are results from it. Others say that there are no results or that you should not consider results. In fact, you should consider results. It doesn't make your acts of generosity selfish to know that there are results from this, positive results. This is very important. This is typically poorly or absolutely not understood, not comprehended in the West. I give endless tea time talks explaining this point again and again, and people are quite appear to be having heard it for the first time. They might have gone to meditation retreats for decades and they, they haven't somehow heard this. This is the critical element that really enriches your humanity. To hold these views is the heart or the emotional structure responds to this. And this tells us something. And even if you're some sort of evolutionary biologist or evolutionary psychologist, uh, you might understand this, that there is a system, an evolutionary pattern of nerves and so forth in the body. And when you manage to get the right formula or right view of things, the system lights up. And it lights up in a very convincing and fulfilling way. And if you have the wrong view, the system does not light up. And that system will give you trouble. You will know that some of the lights aren't on. And when some of the lights aren't on in your little emotional structure, you will feel a sense of lack, dryness, coldness, anxiety, fear, irritability, depression, all of these things are because the right circuits are not being flooded. So this right view, this mundane right view, is how to light up these human circuits. And the supramundane, the ultimate right view, is to illuminate some circuits that are very rarely accessed by humans. There are really hidden circuits and they are only accessed by a small percentage of people. The other mundane right view, the other ones that acknowledge the relationship, the intimate relationships of family and friends, the practice of generosity and the conviction of consequences beyond this very life into other lives and into other dimensions are necessary to light up the human circuitry. So this is what right view is. And by the way, again, I want to emphasize that these are selective. You are selecting these views. You don't need to have ultimate scientific proof of any of this stuff. Please don't wait. Don't wait for absolute logical arguments which are undeniably confirming it. Don't wait for these things. The Buddha also dismisses that approach, waiting for ultimate evidence, waiting for the absolutely perfect logical argument. You don't have time for this. You need to experience the flood of well-being that comes from both mundane right view and the aspiration 
which is not forever, but you can still be a Buddhist and still not have ultimate right view. But you must at least have mundane right view. This is critically important to get this and understand that much of your meditation will be in vain if you don't have the initial compass of where you're sailing. You'll be just drifting and sailing around. You might have periods of time of kind of serenity and so forth, but they are, they are interruptible and they're not going to be enriched. If you don't have right view, the abiding in the deep serenity and joy will not be nourished and sustained. It will be uh, undersized and, uh, and shakeable. So this is the critical nature of right view. And so one should spend some time thinking about this because we are in a society and a culture which fundamentally denies right view. Especially in the more academic world, the scientific world, the technological world, is quite fundamentally in denial of right view. That will have consequences. We will see social consequences. The complete abandonment of right view is a very recent thing. Uh, by the way, only a certain fairly small percentage of the world population really is a fundamentally materialist, annihilationist kind of attitude. It's only a small part of the population. It's surprising that it's not more popular, considering that science is so dominant and that uh, materialism is so dominant. It somehow has not taken off, and I'm quite amazed because it seems that there's an intuitive element in humans. They don't have to be very sophisticated, but they kind of know what works, what works for the human heart. They don't always have undistorted right view, but they will regularly have a very strong a conviction about the nature of one's close relatives and family. Also convictions about generosity, that it does have a good results and that is a necessary part of human existence. And they will also have convictions that there is some sort of possibility of existence beyond this. They will come across this and it will be deeply compelling to them and they will have convictions about this. And they may be very unsophisticated and they really can't maintain good arguments against highly sophisticated philosophers or scientist kind of arguments. But and yet they continue to hold these views. That is interesting about human nature. We shall see about this experiment, but I kind of feel that uh, humans will always gravitate. The core of the emotional structure always gravitates back to this. And wherever it's absent, whenever they try to deny this view, bad things happen. Things fall apart. Life becomes painful. Such things as addictions and uh, strange behavior and even kind of calculated treating whole populations as if they were almost inanimate objects and including uh, animals, treating them as if they were machines rather than beings and treating humans as if they were kind of machines rather than beings. That is a feature of this materialistic annihilationism view. So bad things happen with that. We are yet to see in history how it all plays out. But this is all part of this very, very interesting area of right view. So please reflect and ask yourself, do I have right view?